everyone, and welcome to another episode of Creative Space, a podcast where we explore, learn, and grow in creativity together. I'm your host, Jennifer Logue, and today we have the absolute pleasure of chatting with Sade Lamar Smith, an old friend of mine who is doing incredible work in film. As creative director for the Grammy Award winning artist and entrepreneur, Will I Am, Sade has directed a number of music videos and branded spots including his music video for Faya. He also directed the short film Miss Famous, starring Kristen Wiig and Jimmy Kimmel, which screened at a number of festivals. And Sade's upcoming feature film, Throw It Back, is currently in development. Welcome to Creative Space, Sade. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Oh my gosh. So we were chatting a little bit before we started rolling, but we first met way back at Fordham Lincoln Center college days mm -hmm. yep it was a really great time really great experience i mean it was new york city it was um you know just young millennials coming up and just you know just really trying to make it in in the, in the big city you know yeah we had so many fun times oh my gosh and like um it definitely provided a lot of inspiration for us i think as yeah, we've evolved completely. Completely. I think, I mean, I even, I don't know about you, but I chose New York because I kind of wanted to be inspired. I wanted mm -hmm. to really be around um, other artists, other um, working professionals who um, who were working in entertainment, especially uh, theater. I mean, I came from Miami originally, and um, we have a pretty big theater community, but I mean, nothing compares to New York. New York, there's so much art, so much theater, so much dance, so much film happening, so much fashion happening to it at the yes. same time that I kind of wanted, really wanted to be a part of it from a very young age. Yeah, we were so lucky to have that as like Definitely. a formative experience. Like what a college experience. Right. <laughs> you know? I remember uh, just going over next door to catch like $10 seats at the Met Opera. <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, like we even used to, uh, we were always trying to get rush tickets down uh, on Broadway yes. all the time. We're trying to see like, you know, waiting in line, trying to see if you can see like one of the shows that just opened up or like, you know, something big that was, you know, something big that was happening. So yeah, definitely really amazing. Saw tons of shows too. Lots so of great many. food too. We're oh, and the food. The health kitchen, yeah. <laughs> oh, we were spoiled. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Um, but let's talk about you. Uh, okay, you were studying theater at Fordham, but we're gonna go way back okay. to the beginning. <laughs> um, where are you from originally, Sade? Yeah, so I mean, I, as I said, I'm, I'm originally from Miami, Florida. Uh, so that's where I'm from, but my family's actually from Jamaica and the UK. Oh, very cool. And what was your childhood like? Uh, my childhood was um, pretty cool. Like, I think for me in general, like, I grew up in a household where we studied, I mean, where um, I was definitely like asked to read like a lot of really like big pieces of literature. And I was really kind of like uh, pushed by my mom and my grandmother to like um, read a lot of European literature, but also like look at like a lot of like African folklore and beginnings and things like that. I really take pride in like my culture, especially my family's culture from Jamaica and things like that. So I kind of um, really like approached school with like a really, I think, well-rounded knowledge. Mm. Um, uh, and then I think at the same time, um, from, th from that point on, I was put in performing arts schools um, from fifth grade on. So I was always studying theater for like a very long time from elementary school through middle school into high school. And then um, I began studying dance um, in high school in, a, uh, in conjunction with my theater training so that um, I could be a more well-rounded performer and an um, and, and actor. Love, 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 love. So back in the day, maybe it was an actor, but what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, yeah. So, you know, like when you're, when you're little, you, it's like, you have like a bunch of things. I think at some mm -hmm. point I wanted to be a doctor. At some point after that, I kind of wanted to be, I wanted to be a physicist. I wanted to be a geneticist. I wanted to be, I wanted to work mainly in science. But I think at some point, um, and I think I just kind of did acting because people said, hey, look, you know, you're super creative or you're really good at this thing. So why, why not just, just keep it going? So I was doing it and doing it and doing it. By the time high school came around, I was like, I want to work at entertainment for real. Like I'm looking at like all the science stuff. I'm like, I'm good at science, but science is boring. I can't see myself <laughs> being in a lab all day. And so I kind of was like, okay, 
I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take uh, theater and take entertainment very seriously. So I think from high school on, I had decided I was going to be an actor. Love it. And then you went to Fordham where we mm -hmm. met and you studied theater performance. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest lesson you learned from your studies there? I would say my, my biggest lesson that I learned from my study at Fordham was and I'm, I can. I think I'm always talking to a lot of my friends about this. Is is kind of like not to let like the training that you receive kind of limit you, mm. but to actually like continue to explore, continue to grow, continue to expand. Because what you see yourself as and what and what has naturally always kind of been taught to you might not necessarily be all of who you are, and to just continue growing. I think at Fordham, um, we particularly study like you know like a particular set of techniques. Um, and then I think I kind of went into the world and realized like, hey, look, those techniques weren't always going to be relevant to me as a performer, especially who I am, you know? And then so I was able to like, um, when I when I got out of Fordham, I began to explore more and found that, hey, look, I'm more than just the actor. I'm more than just these Stanislavski techniques. I'm more than just Chekhov, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many other things I could do and so many other things I could fit more closer to me than, than what I was just taught at Fordham's theater program. Yes, you have so many gifts and it's like, how do you combine all these things to fulfill that highest purpose? Oh, um, completely. And I don't really necessarily, I mean, I loved Fordham as a school, but I think um, the Fordham uh, theater program was particularly really dedicated towards being an actor and being a very particular kind of actor. And it wasn't necessarily, um, I would say super, I don't think anything that I was in growing up was super w uh, well uh, geared towards developing me as a whole entire artist, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a very different thing. And I think I really wish more programs would just take uh, more of an opportunity to say, hey, look, how can we develop you more as an artist, oh. you know, because an actor is an artist, but so many actors nowadays branch into so many other different things yes. besides just acting. But I think you go into these schools and they just make you think, hey, acting is going to be it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and don't, going to be it. <laughs> and don't do anything else because then you're going to lose your focus. But exactly. I don't think that's true anymore. Not true anymore, because if you're going to lose your focus, you're going to lose it either way. You know what I mean? Mm. Nothing's going to stop you. You're going to move. So I think it's just important for you to explore those things that you're really passionate about and um and move forward. And I think I continue to do that after Fordham. And I mean, and if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I'm actually happy with what I do. Yes. Know? Well, you should be because you're doing incredible <laughs> work, Sade. Oh, my gosh. It's so cool. Uh, when did you know you wanted to be a filmmaker? Um, It was about two years out of Fordham, I would say. So... Um, funny thing is I, I was having a conversation with my grandmother the other day because she brought up, um, she was like, oh, so you kind of left acting because you didn't like how things were going for you in acting. And I was like, no, that wasn't the case because I was only studying act. I mean, I'd only been out in the industry for two years. Yeah. You know, that's not nearly <laughs> enough time to say, hey, I failed at this or I wasn't doing good at it. You know, I think for me, I began to realize that I had more to say. You know, um, I was doing acting. I was going through these auditions and you're going into the audition. There's always somebody telling you, this is who we have to be. You have to go into the audition as blank slates, you know, and if you have to put these characters on and, and become those people. And all, a lot of times, to be frankly, very honest, and I'm very honest nowadays about these things, um, in the entertainment world, especially when you're acting, people tend to look at you and they want you for a very particular types. Mm -hmm. And there really aren't that many types available in entertainment or in, in, in film or theater for that many, you know, for, for people, you know, and I feel like as a black man coming into, uh, coming into film and theater, the roles are very limited, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I was like, I had auditioned for Raisin in the Sun at uh, multiple regional theaters so many times. And I was like, there has to be more, you know, the, 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 the film work that I was getting even um, was super small, was really small, under five role, I mean, under five lines, for um, parts that weren't really that interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. And as an actor, I really wanted to delve into like more character, things are more complex, more developed. And so um, I, was be I would sit home in my apartment or in other friends' apartments and we'd have all these ideas, all these stories we'd come up with together. And I was like, I kind of want to tell my own stories. You yes. know, and a lot of this particularly happened. I kind of thank Fordham for this too, because Fordham through um Fordham had the program called Global Outreach, where you could mm -hmm. go around the world and travel. And we had and I had traveled to Ghana 
literally a month after I graduated with Fordham Global Outreach. And when I went to Ghana, it was really amazing because I got to see another part of the world. I was really, open, my eyes got open to like all these places where I could tell stories about and tell stories to. And I was like, I want to be a storyteller. You know, I wanted to be a director. I was like, there's so many more things I could be doing, telling stories instead of just being a part of somebody else's story and somebody else's version of me. So um, from then on out, I began to say, okay, cool. If I'm going to do this, how am I going to do it? And I, and I researched and I was like, cool, I can either go ahead and I can intern at varying different places and try to learn film that way and become a film director or film uh, producer, or I could apply for college. And so I decided two years out of school to go ahead and apply for a master's program um, for film directing. Um, I was blessed enough to have gotten into UCLA's film directing program. You know, Francis Ford Coppola had gone there and so many Incredible. other directors. And I was like, this is great. And so I, I got in and I spent four years at Ford. I mean, four years at UCLA after that, so. Oh my gosh, um, amazing story. And that light bulb moment for you, would you say it was when you went to Ghana, when you yeah. saw that how much more there was to tell? Mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, it, it, that light bulb definitely happened. I, I was actually, I would say it was a spark. A, a spark. spark happened when I went to Ghana. The light bulb happened two years in. Um, I was auditioning for a show at a particular theater company. And I had, um, I had, I was also called to do another show at, a, at another theater company. And I didn't necessarily like how I was being played between these two theater companies. Mm -hmm. Like one person wanted me for their show, but the other person also wanted me for their show. And they were kind of were having like back deal conversations about what show I should be in. And I didn't like that. I felt like I had no agency as an actor. I feel like mm -hmm. these people were choosing what show I should be in instead of letting, instead of just saying, hey, look, he is right for, you know, instead of giving me the best opportunity that was out there. And so at that point, I said, um, I, I ended up being in a show that I did not want to go to, you know. And then from that point on, I said, I can't do this. I don't want to be anybody else's pawn. I kind of want to do my own thing. I want to create opportunities for other people. I want to tell my own stories. I don't want to do other people's stories that I also felt like were outdated. I was doing, it was again, I was doing a story that had been told multiple times in multiple theaters. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something else. So the spark really happened after that really big um, event because the, the, that event really left me like torn. It left me like in a very dark place because I was like, I can't live like this. I can't live in a place where people are moving me around as an actor, you know? Um, and so that's kind of, I mean, that's, that's when the light bulb turned. And then after that, I was like, you know what? I was applying for school. I started applying for school and at the same time, I also started, um, I also started interning and being a being a PA on on, on like short film sets, oh, so awesome. I started doing that because I really wanted to see like, do I really like this? Do I really yeah. like directing? Do I really like being on film sets? You know, like not in front of the camera, but being behind the camera yes. because it was scary. You know, you go to Fordham and everybody tells you, oh, you know, like. It, it, Nobody says how, nobody talks about how great it is to be behind the camera. Everybody mm -hmm. talks about how great it is to be in front of the camera, you know? Like, it, it's like, they push you to be seen. You, you get the most reward out of being seen. But mm -hmm. I think things have changed nowadays. Like, you can be seen behind the camera now. Everybody wants to get behind. <laughs> you know, <everybody laughs> right. wants to be that big creator behind everything. So, um, so I would say, yeah, things change. I, I experimented, tried out uh, different things. I, uh, it interned after school, you know, like, you know, people normally intern in school, but I'm interning after school. And then from there, I was like, I really like this. And the, and the universe just kind of lined up, you know, God just said, okay, cool. Like, here's a school, you like this, everything came together. So everything came together. I love mm -hmm. it. Oh my gosh. So this is creative space. And mm -hmm. I love asking this question of everyone because everyone has a different perspective on it. But Shade, how do you define creativity? How do I define creativity? Creativity to me is the force that, creativity to me is a force that God uses to communicate 
ideas and concepts from him through through to everybody else, you know? And I feel like we as humans, especially creative individuals, are vessels for that, you know? And I think it's important for us to like really just kind of close our eyes at the time and tap into creativity so we're able to communicate what needs to be said, you know? Especially, um, and I think people are most creative whenever they're really tapping into that, whenever they really have something to say. Um, I think oftentimes whenever I'm creating a film and they're always like, people look at your script, they're like, what are you trying to say? What do you want to say? What is there? What do you have? What, what is there this need to communicate? You know, and I think there's something very divine about it. Uh, and so to me, that is creativity. I think I don't, for me, creativity isn't just, I would say, you know, making pretty images because people can make pretty images, but creativity is something else. It's a little bit deeper than that. I think creativity is just a small, uh, minuscule, like, um, it's just, a, to me, creativity is just a small, minuscule representation of what it took for God to create the universe. Yes. You know? <laughs> when I create a film, it is just in a small way, um, an example or a small way uh, representative of the amount of creative energy it takes to create this entire thing that we are in, you know? So, yeah. It's like exercising that bit of God that's in us. Ex completely, completely, completely. You know, and I don't mean to get religious or super, but I, I, I feel very, I feel very um, spiritual when it comes to like creativity and things like that. Like, especially when I'm creating films, I always look at the fact that I'm creating a world. Every yes. time I create a film, I have to think about characters, the world, and how the world literally like sits and works together, you know? And if one particular part of this character or this world is off, the entire world is off and it falls apart, mm -hmm. you know? And so I try to make sure that every part of the world, world works perfectly so the story is told perfectly and it reaches its final result and tells and tells the idea, the overarching idea that 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 this world is meant to say and to communicate, you know, for the greater good of, of, of everybody. So because film is what connects us. I mean, mm -hmm. look, we're in the golden age. Well, film and TV, we're in the golden mm -hmm. age of streaming. And mm -hmm. it's just like people are watching TV and film, you know off of streaming services more than they're watching mm -hmm. the news probably. And it's like, it's a way for us to come together too. It is a way for us to come, but it's always been like that. I think ever since the dawn of man, storytelling has always mm -hmm. been a way for people to come together, whether you are dealing with the griot in West Africa or you're dealing with the bard in Europe, like people come together to hear stories, you know? And it's something that's always brought us together and film is just another evolution of that. Yes. You know? mm -hmm. Like <laughs> speaking on those universal truths. Mm-hmm. Yep. that connect us mm -hmm. exactly you know, rather than the things that divide us oh right yeah completely, right? completely. so mm -hmm. and, and i always say like being an artist is a service to the world it completely is especially when you're tapped into that um and, and and you understand that hey look i have a service to do for the world i have something that i have to say i have something that i need to i need people to know so that we can be able to move forward and and evolve as as human beings yes Oh, so interesting. Um, how does creativity come into play in your work as a director? I mean, I know we just talked about you creating worlds and, mm -hmm. um, but high level, okay. creativity as a director. Um, creativity as a director, um, it comes in in so many ways from the from the way that I look at the at, at characters or actors movements on screen to everything from 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 how colors look on screen to sound to music to performance to uh, the basic structure of the story. It comes into play with all of that and I'm forced to like really be creative in all of those different aspects of uh, of, of filmmaking and directing. I actually believe that directing is one of the most expensive or, or filmmaking is one of the most expensive and um, and creatively uh, consuming art forms that you can do because it requires you to think creatively in so many different ways in terms of movement, in terms of color, in terms of sound, in terms of um, acting and performance in 
in, 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 in all these different parts of your artistry that, you know, other professionals don't do. When you're an artist, you're very visual. When you're a dancer, you're based in your body. When you are um, doing music, you're thinking about like sound and things like that. But when you're directing, you have to think about all of that. You know, and the best directors to me have a complete and strong knowledge of of multiple different art forms is so that they can be because because you have to bring so many art forms together. Yes. And what I love about your career so far is that you bring in so much of your past training into like even before you studied filmmaking, like your experience as a dancer, your experience as an actor into your directing. Mm -hmm. um, I just watched uh, your Bose branded spot. <laughs> and I loved the movement. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I can feel the heart of a dancer in this. Yeah. It made me feel I mean, so good. We definitely had to think about movement a lot when it comes to that. And it's not just movement with the actors on screen, but movement of the camera. You yes. know, what's the camera doing? How is the camera moving? How does the camera feel when it moves? Um, and so you, you re we really have to think about movement a lot. And not just movement with just camera or acting, but movement in editing. You know, how is the edit? What does the pace of the edit look like? The edits, I don't think people realize, but editing, there's particular dancing that happens that ha um, when you're watching sequences in front of you. You know, the pacing of it, to me, that's all choreography. You know, mm -hmm. whether it's going fast or whether it's going slow. And also that pacing intrinsically, I think, connects to viewers. And it, it, it the dance that happens in, in the pacing tells a story on a very subconscious level that carries people through through what they're viewing so many levels mm -hmm. oh my gosh this is so interesting we're gonna have to do a part two like i mean Shada, you gotta teach like you know a filmmaker's course or something because you have such a unique perspective on it well i mean i'm still learning a lot even even yeah. as i i do it like i feel like it was with any any art form the more you do it the more you learn but i think i mean i just come with it from that perspective and that's how i approach all of my work um i see dance in all of it like but I also see, you know, so many different art forms in it. And I think it's just important to do that. I just remember um, listening to you uh, make music, you know, when we were back at Fordham. Yeah. And also outside of just like dance, like I had to do a lot of music because I listened to a lot of musical theater before this. Mm -hmm. So like musicality is also important because dance and music are the same thing. So you talk about editing, it's not just a dance with the pictures, but it's the musicality of the picture, you yes. know? Um, in the rhythm of the picture, <laughs> you know, and how that communicates to people. So rhythm is such an important part of language in general. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, and I've found that too in just writing, like mm -hmm. even copywriting, like mm -hmm. it's making a headline sing or, you know, making the script sing. Exactly. It's, it's like, it's not just what you say, it's how it's said. Said, yes. You mm -hmm. know, it's so interesting how all these things come together. Yes, completely. <laughs> I, I think it was Steve Jobs. He said, things will make sense looking forward, but looking backward, they make sense. Yes. When you look at your life. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like we, were, right. we follow yeah. the right path so far. I definitely was thinking like, because sometimes I used to look, I used to be like, why am I learning all these things if I'm not going to do that? Yeah. When I, started directing, <laughs> when I started directing, I was like, oh, because I needed all of that to direct or to create film, you know, so completely. Yes. It's follow your passions. You, it doesn't mm -hmm. always make sense at the time. Right. But if you have that spark, just go for it. Just go for it. Yep. In the okay. end, you'll meet cool people and it'll be fun. Definitely. <laughs> so um, what's a typical day like for you as a director? Is there such a thing? Um, there are parts, there are typical days like directors. So, I mean, like there are some days where I literally wake up, I, um, walk my dog, I will write, um, for an hour and then, uh, or for two hours even, and then I will, uh, continue on with my day job. Cause as a day job, I'm a creative director for a brand. So I also work in advertising too. Mm -hmm. So in advertising, all about storytelling. So, so, and then, and then I plan my day working, um, at, at, at that job as a creative director or creative director for multiple jobs. And then that would be like one type of day for me. That's like my most basic day. I mm -hmm. write, I creative direct, and then I close the day out. Um, another day would be me, um, in pre-production for, uh, um, for, a uh, for, I, I would say like either a feature or a commercial. So I'd wake up, 
I would immediately I start pre-production. Like I'd be doing all of my phone calls to different um to my cinematographer or to my producers. I'm out here storyboarding or I'm out here looking through scripts and things like that. So that whole day is mainly consumed in the pre-production process. And then there are those days that you're actually just pr pr that you're in production. You wake up, <laughs> you go straight to set, <laughs> and you are directing all day long. You come home and you go to sleep. Yes. And that to me are like the three typical days of of of, of me as, as a director. Oh my gosh, that was so organized and so clear. I'm like, wow, I got a picture into a little, <laughs> a little slice of Sade's life. This is but, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've done a number of music videos for Will I Am, with mm -hmm. the Black Eyed Peas, like Rick and more. What is your process like when coming up with a concept for a music video? Um, well, the first thing I like to do is listen to the music, of course. So you hear the music and you think about what images come to your head when, 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 you think about the, when I think about the music. And I can get those images and I, and I keep those images to myself and I talk to the artists because the artists, when it comes to music videos, are a big part of, the, are a big part of it. So it's two artists in the room. And um, unless I'm directing my own feature film, anything else I'm doing for less client work is a collaborative process, a more of a collaborative process in terms yes. of creativity. Usually if I'm doing a feature or doing something that I wrote, I'm the top of the food chain. Everybody pays attention to the idea that comes out of my head and they add to it to expand on it. When it comes to something like a music video, the artist and I are the top of the food chain. We have to collaborate to come up with the ideas and then everybody works to expand and, and bring that idea to life. Mm -hmm. So after I come up, after I have my thoughts, I'd, I talk to the artist, the artist will have their thoughts. And then we kind of work together to see like what we can create together to bring our ideas together. I would normally defer to their idea before mine because I'm not really precious about the work. It's their music. <laughs> and so yeah, yeah. it's theirs, you know, so I want to make sure that that they have what they're looking for that, that best expresses who they are. And then we direct it and we get and we and we, and we execute and call it a day. Oh my gosh. So much fun. Um, I gotta ask, what is the greatest challenge you've faced in your career so far? Hmm. Um, I would say the greatest challenge that I've faced in my career so far, motivation. I would say the ability to stay motivated through it all is sometimes very difficult. Uh, I think people, I think a lot of things, um, there are a lot of really wonderful, beautiful things about working entertainment. I think like there's a lot of really fun times. I think there are a lot of really, um, uh, a lot of a lot of times to celebrate great, great work, but there's a lot of also really dark times, you know, like moments where you really, you know, where you're waiting for a project to get off the ground and it's just not time, you know, where, um, where you're taking meetings over and over again and the same people meeting with you and they're like, hey, they want to meet, but nothing ever comes out of those meetings. And you just have to keep trusting and believing that, okay, cool. It's not now, but it's going to happen later because, you know, like sometimes great things do happen. Like these Bose commercials, they're working for Will I Am. Yes. But then people don't re understand there are long periods, like, and there are projects that are literally boiling inside you that you want to get out and you just don't see them or they're taking forever to, to come out. And those moments do not, sometimes will never, I mean, like, your high moments sometimes will never uh, outweigh the moments of you waiting for your dream project to get off the ground, you yes. know, so I think. Um, and so when your dream project sometimes uh, is in a waiting, you know, keeps you in the waiting room, it's very easy to lose motivation. You know, it's very easy for you to say, you know, like, why am I still, it's very easy for you to be like, why am I still doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's very easy for you to lose motivation, you know, and then so you kind of have to have, you know, great people, great friends around you that can like continue to push you, you know, you really have to kind of like um, do things, therapy, um, have like uh, a really good like grounding and like spirituality um constantly like forcing yourself to read and watch new things uh just keep you motivated because it's not about you necessarily like saying like oh it's not about the fact that you don't want to do this anymore it's about the fact that you start believing that you can't do it anymore 
Yes. Because people keep telling you or things keep saying this, this, this is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think our motivation becomes, they, they becomes very, uh, becomes one of the more diff keeping that it becomes very difficult in the, in, 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 in my career. Um, so I wanted to ask when you came out of UCLA, how did you go about starting to work in the field? Like, how did you get yourself off the ground those um, first few years? I'm very thankful that I actually went to, that I lived in New York before living in LA because yeah. living in New York as an actor was very hard, very difficult, but it was a crash course in how difficult the entertainment industry was. Mm. So when I got out of UCLA, people, everybody expected me to go ahead and teach as a, as a professor at a college somewhere or do something that was super... Um, Everybody expected me to do something that was uh, where I'd be making a ton of money really quickly. And I was like, no, I'm going to go. I want something small. You know, I, I want a really small job that's going to allow me the time to write, you know, and really allow me time to to, to create work that I can sell or, or figure out. So people were looking at me super, super crazy about that. Um, and then luckily my friend came to me and was like, well, I mean, I, I was like doing some really tiny assistant editing gigs here and there. I was even studying to become a bartender. Oh, I was doing pretty much everything I was doing when I was an actor right out of UCLA, you know, for a good year. And every people were looking at me like, dude, you just got a master's degree, spent all this money. Now you're going to go bartend. I'm like, yeah, but, 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 but I had already known what it's like to work in entertainment. Yes. <laughs> like, I was like, guys, you guys haven't worked in entertainment before. I've worked in this as an actor. I know how difficult this is buckle up because it's going to be rough yeah. <laughs> you, know? you were but you're ready for it because you have a vision and yeah because i had the vision and i had already been through like some really rough times in new york so i um and then luckily like i had a friend who came to me and was like hey well i am looking for a receptionist and i was like okay uh let me see if i apply i didn't really expect to get it because don't be most receptions to be honest and it's like not a sexist thing but most receptions are women so i was like am i gonna get a receptionist and you know like I'm a black dude coming in saying I'm going to be reception at your front desk, bringing people in. And um, and luckily I got the job. I got the job. I was hired, you know, by a really great staff. And I, I was Will, Will I Am's receptionist and wow. well, for a good little bit. And is that how the relationship began? Yeah, I went, I, I was Will I Am's receptionist. And uh, about a year in, he needed some video content made to, you know, just to make a long story short, about a year in, he needed some video content made. And there was really like nobody in the art, I mean, in, in the building that knew about directing and things like that. And Will I Am, he had cameras, he had sound stage, he had all this equipment, wow. but he just really had like nobody that really worked for him uh, full time that could do that. So um, I luckily had some spec work that I had made and I had, I, I was, I had also made like a spec um, project with a friend of mine, Dylan, who's a cinematographer. And I made it, and I made some spec work using Will's headphones, which was his, his, his buttons headphones. Yes. I made some spec work and then Will's um, chef at the time uh she really encouraged me to go and show it to will she's like show it to will and i was like uh okay cool i'll show it to will i really just wanted to keep it as a spec and I had really great friends some great friends i mean like they all kind of told me hey look prepare a budget because you know he might like it you know what i mean he yeah. might want to know how to make more work like that i was like cool so i showed will the spec projects i had made using his buttons headphones and um, he was really impressed. So he showed it to a lot of his marketing team and creative team. And he was like, hey guys, like Sade at the front desk made this stuff. It looks really good. He has a degree in the in, in this thing. And um, and Will literally that day made, I mean, I went from one one day I was a receptionist and like literally the next week I became, a, I became his creative director. Incredible Sade. Yeah. But as Oprah <laughs> says, you know, uh, luck is when opportunity meets preparation, right? Yeah. And that's pretty much what happened at that moment. So, oh, I mean, beautiful. that moment kind of like changed, you know, the course of like my career, my, my career, you know, and I'm really thankful to Will. I'm really thankful to, to my friends. I'm really thankful to Dylan. I'm really thankful to Will Chef Pam at the time. Like um, it, it, it really changed a, a lot of things. Wow. Yes. Um. So. Because... And a lot of it, I'm sorry to say, oh, but. For... I think it's important for people to realize like a lot of it had to go, had to came from just lowering your ego. You know, I think 
if I had a high ego, I would have said, I'm not going to be Will I Am's receptionist. But I said, no, I'm going to be receptionist. Like this industry is all, you have to release the ego and then see like where the universe is going to take you, you know? So I have to say, I worked as a receptionist for a while and, uh, it taught me so much. I don't regret it at all. Mm -hmm. It taught me how to be on all the time. Yep. Even when people weren't friendly or, Mm -hmm. you know, to always be friendly and to always be gracious. Yep. Like, I think it's also like working in the service industry, Mm -hmm. you know, it, it teaches you these invaluable soft skills too. Yes. Yes. But the ego thing, that's, the biggest lesson is well, I think it really keeps people back. A lot of this industry is their ego. You know, they think they're too big for this. Or they think they should be doing this or they want this. And it's like, look, everybody's talented around here. Yeah. There's so much talented. What makes you think that you that you deserve this more than the next person? You know, just work hard, lower your ego and keep pushing forward, you know, and then I think good things should work out at some point, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Cause it just keeps the energy flowing mm-hmm. when the ego is not getting yes. in the way. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, so what's something about being a director that the average person doesn't realize? Hmm. What's something about being a director that the average person doesn't realize? I think, and to kind of bring this back to what I was saying before, um, being, I mean, what somebody, what people don't normally realize about being a director is that one, I believe the best directors have a strong knowledge of multiple art forms. And two, being a great director requires being extremely detail oriented. Mm. Because you can't just come on set and be like, oh, I kind of want this to happen. I'm cool, sort of kind of thinking like that. No, when you approach it, <laughs> every single little thing is planned out, you know? And yes, there are ways, there, there are times where you give space for you to kind of learn new things, but even those spaces are planned out. <laughs> you know, hey, look, I, I'm going to plan time for me to figure this out on set, you know? Um, but detail, detail, detail. I think is key to being a great director. And a lot of people don't really realize that people think you just go on set and, um, and order people around and do whatever they think cameras appear out of thin air. They think actors <laughs> appear out of thin air. They think money appears out of thin air. Mm. They think all these things come out of nowhere. And it's like, no, all that stuff is planned out. All that stuff is sought after. Like, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of detail work and it's a lot of strong understanding of, of multiple art forms. Yeah, because you're moving things at such a pace and so many people are involved, so much equipment, machinery is involved that mm-hmm. it's also expensive yes, for everybody. It, so many different languages in terms of like creative languages. You know, when I'm when I'm talking to the sound person, I'm like, hey, you know, can you bring that sound? I mean, can you bring this down a little bit more or can I get more reverb on this particular mm-hmm. track? Oh, look, the levels here are too high. Can you bring that level down over here? When you're talking to the editor, you have to know how to talk editor talk. When you're talking to choreographers that come on set, oh, no, can she do a couple more turns over here? Um, and maybe instead of um, when she twerks in that part, can she do like maybe a good bop ma here and then turn a run off stage? And they're like, great, cool. So you're like, it's like all these different little languages that you kind of have to know in order to get. In, in order to be, I think, a strong director. I think you can still direct without knowing multiple, you know, different art forms. But I think the best directors, the ones that I value know, they're very solid in talking to all, because your job as director is not to merely create the piece. Your job as a director is to be the strongest collaborator in the, mm. in the project. Your job is to bring all these people together in order to tell a particular story and to really uh, execute a particular idea. And if you can't communicate, then you can't really be a good director. That is a beautiful definition of what a director is. <laughs> and on that note, who are your favorite directors? Okay, my favorite directors. Um, I would say some of my favorite directors are uh, Spike Lee, Lee Daniels, Ridley Scott, Stanley Kubrick. Oh, nice mix. Oh my gosh. <laughs> They're not my favorite. I mean, like they don't have my favorite films though, but they are my favorite directors. Like I generally, I would, I classify my favorite directors as if I like 
more than two of their films, they can gradually, you know, like rise up into being um, my favorite directors. And those four people, I generally like a lot of their films. Um, and top three films? Okay, cool. So my top three films, they don't belong to my favorite directors, but they are Black Orpheus, Set It Off. Um, actually, no, Precious does belong to my favorite directors. Mm. So that's a Lee Daniels film, so I actually do like Precious. Uh, Set It Off, Black Orpheus, Precious. Yeah, that's top three. That's three. You could do five if you want, if you have more. Okay, and then my fourth and fifth I like Sydney Lumet's The Wiz. I just watched that yesterday, two days ago. Oh. <laughs> the Wiz. And um, what else? 2001 A Space Odyssey. That's another favorite film, one of my favorite. Yes, yeah, so it's Stanley Kubrick. So five. Okay. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Required watching everyone. Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. There's one more. Sick. Okay. I got to keep this one. Okay. <laughs> um, I saw this at Cannes. It became one of my favorite films. Uncle Boon Me Who Can Recall His Past Lives. Wait, Sydney. repeat that again. Uncle Boon Me, who can recall his past life. Is this from this year? No, it's from 2010. It's by a Thai director. I forgot his name. I, not a, I, it's not I forgot his name. I just can't pronounce his name. Okay. But, um, but he did Tropical Malady and Uncle Boon Me. And, um, and Uncle Boon Me is probably one of the, it's a very beautiful film. Um, it's a Thai film. And I, I think it, the imagery and the storyline really captured me because it's at the, um, it, because it dealt so much with, with folklore mm. from that uh, particular part of the world and it dealt with death in a very uh. interesting way it was very moving for me so yeah cool well I'll drop a link to it in the show notes yeah <laughs> so I'll, I'll hunt it down uh, so I gotta ask going back to um your collaborative relationship with Will I Am uh what's the collaborative relationship like now that you've been working together um well me and will, i haven't worked with will since 2020 so we don't really work together right now but for the four years that i did work with him it was great it was really really awesome um there were i mean maybe a few times that we butt heads but other than that everything was pretty smooth like he had an idea I executed that idea and I added to the idea and helped it grow. Like normally everything would be very spur of the moment because Will's very fast. He has something on his yes. head and wants to get it done. So he'd say, like, I remember the first time when I did uh, the fire video, he hit me up and he's like, Shada, I need you to go to London. We're shooting a, I'm shooting a music video because he went on The Voice and he told everybody, I can make a video in, I believe this is how it happened. He went to the, he was on The Voice <laughs> and he said, I can make a music video by next week. And they're like, okay, go ahead. And oh he my gosh. Like, hey, come, we're going to make a video. And I'm like, what? Oh my God. And literally the next day I was on a flight to London. I had, I, um, and he, I was like, who's my cinematographer? He's like, bring, bring whoever you normally bring. So I oh grabbed my gosh. This is and amazing. We're on a flight to London. <laughs> Me and Dylan are in the same room in London. And literally the next day the tour bus comes by. We're on the tour bus on our way to Manchester. Everything's already set because he wanted to, to shoot the video on the set of the London um, Soap Coronation Street. So it, pretty much everything's planned already. And he kind of wants the video to be executed. So I just kind of, I mean, the choreography here, he has dancers that he's already working with for this song. So I just had to pretty much make sure that the camera and the choreography and the set and everything worked together, that it was lit the way we needed to be lit mm. and it worked out well, so. Yeah, I love the movement, though, of the cameras and the dancers, like everything just worked so perfectly in lockstep. Yeah, yeah, it, it was really dope, but it was very quick. We had to really, we, we had to really pull that one together. I um, mean, I always believe that if I have more time, I could do much more amazing things. But um, sometimes you have very little time, you just have to think very quickly. And also that that's where um understanding multiple art forms where that comes in because sometimes you have to be like okay boom 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 and knock it out but knowledge of those varying art forms helps you to execute things quicker yes mm -hmm. i love that video thank you oh my gosh <laughs> you also directed the short film miss famous with kristen wig and jimmy kimmel what was it like working with them it was great i mean um funny thing was that when i was working with uh kristen wig 
uh everybody would tell me hey Shade, she wants to improv you know just let her do whatever on set and things like that and uh so i assumed that you know it's gonna be like that was that was me very difficult i thought like you know like it was gonna be super super um i thought she was gonna be a big celebrity because that's i mean like you know when I, well, she is a big celebrity but i thought people she was gonna come in with like this this ego mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that's how kind of people made it seem and honestly like um i had been asking i was like hey guys like I'm a direct, I'm directing Kristen Wiig and I've never spoken to her. I can, I, can I talk to her? And everybody yeah. was like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's very difficult. Cause I granted, I was like, when I made Miss Famous, I was still in grad school. Mm -hmm. So I was still considered a student director. So, um, but finally, like one of the producers snuffed me her number and they're like, Hey, look, here's Chris's number. Call her. I think she wants to talk to you. So then I call, I call Chris and I was like, hey, Kristen, this is Sade. Um, I'll be directing you tomorrow. And she's like, finally, I've been waiting to talk to you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like, great. They told me that, that I could talk to you. She's like, no, I'm just sitting home on my washing machine, by my washing machine, waiting for it to get fixed. I was oh like, I could have been, been talking to you. So we talked or whatever. Funny thing is she came on set. And I was like, okay, cool improv. She was more like, well, I, you know, what do you want me to do? You know, I'm, I'm really interested. In like, where, so she actually came on very prepared, like an mm. actor willing to give her best performance, willing to, really wanted to give her her all. And it wasn't just about improv. She, she came prepared. She came really, um, really uh, sure about really, you know, developing this part in this role. So um, it was a blessing to really work with her. Jimmy Kim was a little bit different. He didn't really have that much time. So he came on set, delivered his lines, executed it when he needed when he needed to execute it. And then he was gone. So um, I had no really big or bad issues with the two of them. And I can honestly say that uh, Kristen Wiig was a pleasure to work with. Lovely. And how do you work with writers when you're working, you know, as, when you're working as a director and you have a writer you're working with? How is that? What are some of the best practices you think for that kind of relationship, like bringing a writer's vision to life? Um, that is interesting because writers are a little funny. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, because honestly, I think a lot of writers generally want their complete vision like executed on screen, but sometimes the visions aren't they aren't practical. They don't mm -hmm. work, you know. Um, either the budget doesn't work for it or certain things don't work and we have to change things around. And also my job as a director is make sure that the story is told. Some yes. things may read well on paper and they don't read well on screen. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes I think um, my, I think sometimes my time with writers can be a little bit tenuous, but um, in general, I mean, in, in general, in general, I would say that um, work with writers is not difficult as long as you guys communicate. Again, it's about communicating, talking the writer's language, you know, um, talking about, you know, just, I think being very upfront about the fact that, hey, look, this isn't working or this is working really well. And also asking them, hey, look, what were you trying to accomplish with this particular part? So I know how to execute it with the characters. Mm. So it's just communication, I think for the most part. I think for uh, normally I'm, I end up directing stuff that I've written, but with Miss but with Miss Famous, I was directing something that the writer had written, which was adapted from another story. So, um, so with there, it's it's just more about collaboration and um, collaboration, and um, I think it's just mainly about collaboration and communication. Just being good collaborators and being yeah. open mm -hmm. to tell the best story. Yes, that you completely. can. Mm -hmm. And you also have your feature film debut with Throw It Back. Mm -hmm. What's the story about? Can we talk about that? Oh, yeah. So Throw It Back is pretty much based on my high school experiences growing up in Miami. Uh, it's all based around the time that um, Trina and Trick Daddy shot a music video at my high school growing up. So I pretty much made this entire film a about a rapper that goes to a high school in Miami to shoot a music video and all hell breaks loose. Oh my so gosh. it's like a teen dramedy filled with dance. I consider it more like uh, a dance musical dramedy or actually like um, to me is also considered like one gigantic music video. Um, so yeah, I would say that's pretty much like the gist of throw it back. Oh my gosh. I feel like it's going to have a lot of energy. Oh yes. It's definitely a lot of energy. Very colorful. Very, um, I, I think, um, when we, when we actually get it done and execute, it should be very fun, very exciting. And I think it should really fully represent me, my past. And I think who I am as a director. 
Yes, your full self as an artist. Yes, exactly. I love it. Love it. (laughs) Uh, Where do you see the film industry going in the next 10 years? Ooh, that's a loaded question. Um, I've had multiple theories on what the fi- on what the film industry is going. One thing I think that like on one hand, maybe like studios would break down and we mm. and you'll find like some sort of like strange feudal system where you just see a bunch of small studios that make projects. Since like big budget blockbusters really are difficult to get off nowadays, mm. or even middle level films are very difficult to get off nowadays. So I think you're you're seeing that. I mean, like that could happen. Um Another thing is just a, a, an industry where the streamers really take control. You know, the streamers become the distributors. And then again, that these feudal studios begin to like just make content to to, to head towards those head towards those streamers. But I see it. Um, I see the film industry kind of going in in that kind of place. And in terms of content, I don't know. I mean, hopefully I think right now everybody's looking for fresh new content but like music and like anything else happening in the digital age it's very difficult to necessarily say or force feed people a certain kind of content because people are gradually going towards what they feel and it's very difficult nowadays to figure out what people are feeling you know so I think people I think the industry right now is pretty much relying on like old films remakes um sequels but at some point it had like that entire bubble has to burst because People are over it. Like, I think people are gradually just getting over like that thing. I think at some point you're just going to find a lot more smaller. um, I think you're going to end up finding smaller films that are more nuanced. Yes, because there's so many stories that need to be told. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, and we live in such a diverse world. Yep. So many different perspectives that like, Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I'm with you. I think we're going to start seeing that. Yeah, but we do. I hope we do too, but right now we're in a very funny place. I think um, two industries I think are really doing really, I mean, I, well, I think after working in music, I don't, I don't think music is in a very funny place in terms of how to make money. And I think of that, um, that, that film is kind of in that place, but film actually, I think has more of an infrastructure that's more conducive to making money. Mm-hmm. I think right now it's just about getting streamers to pay the money that's required so that um filmmakers and everybody is able to and everybody's able to to kind of do what they want to do what they want to do and make the work that they want to make um what is your greatest hope for the future of film um my greatest hope for the future of film is that we end up in a place where differing voices can be told and film can be bought and sold in multiple places besides the traditional market that we have nowadays. I think nowadays it feels like our market's very geared towards um very geared towards the US and Europe for the most part. Mm. And I really wish that our market was much more expansive, you know, in terms of just like being able to buy and sell like hardcore films more in South America and in Africa, particularly, um, and even in parts of Asia, so that we're all kind of like sharing in the entertainment and storytelling um, experience together. You know, I think now people are really opening up more to films with subtitles, as long as the story is good, yes. <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah, I, I'm really looking for something that's a lot more global where people can really buy and sell stories from differing cultures, differing peoples, differing mindsets. Um, and, you know, yeah. Awesome. The appetite's there. Yes. <laughs> I think the appetite's there. It's just about getting these old industry execs to buy into it and to not be afraid to take risks and lose money in, 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 in getting it to that place. Yes. What advice do you have for directors just starting out study mm. <laughs> i think the biggest advice i have for directors is to study to train it doesn't have to be in a school setting or university setting but it's important for them to take classes it's important for them to learn acting it's important for them to learn about all these varying skills it's important for them to to just train you know to understand what it's like to being a director because directing is a skill you know, it's not just, it's not like other things where you can kind of guess your way through it, you mm-hmm. know, like acting. Act, all the acting to me requires skill, but you know, nowadays people are out here just guessing their way through acting and just kind of moving through and becoming big stars, but directing requires skill. And I think of the best, and if you want to be a good director, 
you should get training so that you become a more skilled director. Yes. Mm -hmm. And all the forms that you're going to be dealing with on all set. the forms that, that you're dealing with on set, taking classes in sound design, taking classes in. Um, and that's one of the things that, that that we kind of got at UCLA. We had that first year was a super big crash course in production. There were times I had to hold the boom mic. And there were times that I had to go into the sound mix studio when we're mixing our short films. There were times that they took me to see um, other sound mix sessions at other studios. I had great editing teachers who brought me in and, and watched and showed me how they were editing bigger feature films for studios. There were all these different things I had to kind of learn. I had to be a gaffer. I had to be a grip and carry the C-stands around. I had to be a cinematographer at multiple points. I had to be an editor. Editing actually became my side skill in addition to directing for me to make money. Wow. So I had to learn Photoshop. I had to learn After Effects. There were all these skills I had to learn and it only helped me to be able to communicate later. Um, and be a better director. It's so important. Mm -hmm. uh, what's next for you? Um, what's next for me? Um, I believe what's next for me is continuing to direct, like uh, really getting a story that I've written off the ground. I think that is my next big goal is to kind of do that and to um, really develop myself in terms of that when it comes to when it comes to directing and then also just kind of develop myself more uh, as a creative director when it comes to advertising. So I kind of have like those two uh, career trajectories right now. One is creative directing when it comes to, uh, with advertising and brand work. And another one is directing when it comes to storytelling uh, and feature films and sort of kind of in there in the beginning is my commercial I mean, in, in the middle somewhere in the middle of there is my commercial directing you know that's kind of a mix between what I do as a creative director for brands and then what I do as a director for uh stories and like uh feature films and short films very cool well Sade it's been an absolute pleasure as I said before your journey is so inspiring you are so inspiring you're Thank such you. a light <laughs> For more on Sade Lamar Smith, visit SadeLamarSmith.com. And thank you so much for tuning in and growing in creativity with us. I'd love to know what you thought of today's episode, what you found most interesting, what you found most helpful. You can reach out to me on social media at Jennifer Logue or leave a review for Creative Space on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover it. I appreciate you so much for being here in the beginning stages of this. My name is Jennifer Logue, and thanks for listening to this episode of Creative Space. Until next time.